God's true intent behind the law. Part 55 The Law of Love. The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign. This is about the third message in the mini series of this major series, The Law of Love. The Just Jesus Evangelistic Campaign, Day 324 since January the 20th, 2017, and Day 691 since January the 1st, uh, 2016. In a few days, by the grace of God, uh, I would have preached 700 gospel messages over the past two years by the grace of God and we thank God for the privilege to be a small part of his evangelistic enterprise. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 45. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. I hope you don't hate anybody in your heart because that's not what God said. God has never said hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. <clears throat> Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, and if you will, are even Judas's to you, that ye may be the children of your father, and I mention Judas because you might recall that Jesus dealt with Judas, his inside enemy he did it he practiced what he preached but he did say what thou doest do quickly and uh, even though you are evil and wrong uh, hear this rebuke and then when Peter came and when, when Jesus was betrayed by Judas and Judas betrayed him with all things uh, of all things with a kiss rather and Jesus looked at him and said betrayest thou me with a kiss that's what Judas is do he didn't cut off his head he didn't let Peter cut off his head. He still showed love even though he rebuked Judas. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for allowing us to be here for 100 days straight, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day, preaching your holy word and uh, pointing thousands and maybe even millions to you. And Lord, uh, we thank you for the results that we have seen but we know that your word, when it goes out, does not come back void, 
we know that you in heaven, uh, you know exactly all that has taken place from the preaching of your holy gospel that has the power uh, under salvation. And we pray that uh, over three million souls would hear the gospel preached and be saved. Over three million Christians would be revived. And that your holy name would be glorified and Jesus Christ would be lifted up. For it is in his name we pray and for his sake. On this Christmas Eve and on the 100th day of preaching the gospel since September the 15th. Uh, and allowing us to see the end of this leg. The Lord help us to get some rest and to get prepared for another leg in the near future by your grace. In Jesus Christ's name we pray as we approach uh, and we go towards 1,000 days of preaching the gospel for the salvation of the lost and for the revival of the saved. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Spurgeon said, God constantly does that which many people regard almost as a crime, namely doing good to the undeserving. It is the very genius of Christianity to help those who are utterly unworthy, to be kind and generous even to those who are pretty certain to repay us with ingratitude, unthankfulness, and malice. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a story that I read this past week, how that some parents are not buying their children any toys because they're so unthankful and so ungrateful. What if God was that way towards us? We would have been in hell already. Amen, somebody. We often approach our enemies from the standpoint of trying to get back at them. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and we have many Christians who are supposed to be under grace who have not received that from God but that's their philosophy too not only President Trump but that's their philosophy as well you hurt me so I'm gonna hurt you you mistreated me so I'm gonna mistreat you you said something negative to me so I'm going to say something negative back. At least I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Or worse, I'm going to put my two cents in it. Now keep your two cents and keep your mind. Let it go. Always out to defend yourself. Always out to prove a point. That's why so many marriages have so many problems. Because some... Somebody wants to have the last word. The husband said, now that's the last word and that's final. The rebellious wife said, mm, no it's not either. Everybody is back and forth in our society today. From politics to the church to Hollywood, to business. Everybody is trying to get everybody back. To even the highway. You pull in front of me, I'll I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull out and then pull in front of you. And this goes back and forth until somebody gets out of the car when they get in the traffic and start shooting. Always trying to prove that we are right and somebody else is wrong. 
can't let it be. Our stinking pride is always trying to prove ourselves to be right and somebody else wrong. Even though it does not gain anything. Jesus commands us, beloved, to love our enemies in order to prove something different, if you will, that we are the children of our Father in heaven. See, the proof of your being saved and a child of God is your love for one another, and that includes your family. And your love even for your enemies and love for lost people. By the way, do you love lost people? Do you ever try to reach them? Do you have anybody going to the candlelight service with you tonight? Do you have uh, anybody uh, beside you in church that you loved enough to invite them to church? So that they can meet the same Jesus that you have met? Most of us as Christians do not love sinners, which we used to be and we still are. We like to be around our beloved brethren and sisters all of the time. Fellowship. And not go out and invite others. Who might even be our enemies. You see, it is one thing to say you are a child of God, but it is another thing to act like a child of God. To be loving even towards your enemies. And, and by the way, your enemies may be in your own household. Do you love them? And by the way, this does not touch having to practice tough love in the family context. In the family it is not your job in other people's family, but in your family, uh, oftentimes you need to practice tough love towards rebellious children or even if you're a husband, a rebellious and stubborn wife. So what about the wife? Uh, 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 dealing with the rebellious and stubborn husband, let God deal with him. Everybody will be better off. Just let God take care of the man. It's not the wife's place. You say, oh, I'll tell you what, it's my place. Well, that's why your, uh, uh, your family and your household is a hellhole. And there's a bunch of garbage going on all the time. Or you have beaten the man down into the ground, back into his little cave. Man cave. That's where they come from. The man has had to build him a cave in his house to get away from his uh, barbarian wife. And so uh, she, she rules and she has the stick and she has beaten him back into his little man cave. He could go to the roof like the Bible says because it's raining so he built himself a man cave to protect him where he can lock, he locks it has a lock on the door from the inside to keep her out. So be that as it may, the practice of tough love and make sure the love is in there. But love oftentimes must be tough, tough when you're dealing with stubborn, rebellious, uh, demonically driven people in your family. We heard the other day that Sarah Palin had some issues in her uh, family, her Christian family life. And you hear about this uh, sometimes among our white brethren where the sons rile up against the father and want to fight the father and so forth like that. Uh, that would never happen in my family. Uh, because that will be the last time ever, ever they raised their hand at me or their mother. And that will be the last time you're in my house. That doesn't happen too much in the, 
in the black home. Uh, at least it used to not happen even with the, with the mother being single because back in the day uh, the mother would take a six foot four boy of hers and pinch his ear off and dare him to do anything and just pinch and have his head bent down almost to the ground in tears and she's nothing but five foot two and weighs a hundred pounds uh, so that won't happen in the White House but it's happening in houses and homes all across this country you know why because we got uh, husbands and fathers who don't practice tough love love contrary to what people think is not this gushy letting people have their way letting them act like the devil in your house no no love is oftentimes having to rebuke people and practice tough love and whip their behinds okay so don't get it twisted now in general which we're talking about people pay attention to our actions more than our words there's no good for you to go down to a lady on the corner with a sign saying I need bread to eat and you bend down in your stilettos and say I love you and God bless you and you don't give them any food your words are meaningless she will sense all of the love known to mankind if you bring her uh, a meal from Chicken Express with a soda to boot or at least some water she will sense all of the love in the world if you invite her to your house and eat dinner with your family and thank God for the Christians who do that who are moved with God's compassion who will pull over their town car or pull over their Lincoln or pull over their Mercedes and say get in I don't need for you to do any work for me, but I'm going to take you to Walmart and get you some clean clothes. I'm going to take you to my house. You're going to shower and clean up. And uh, we're going to get to know you. And you're going to get to know us. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And I'm going to feed you a feast that you have you will never forget. And then we're going to help you get a job or get skills to do a job. And there are many Christian families who can do that. Just take one person. The homeless problem would be solved, listen to me and listen to me carefully, the homeless problem would be solved instantaneously tonight if sorry Christians would get off of their do-nothing and just pick up one person and take them home. Oh, he might kill us. He, he might be an axe murderer. He might. Uh, he might. God wants you to practice faith, but He does not want you to be foolish. And you know that. You know how to do it. You single women should not go out here picking up a man. Tell me, we're going to fix him up. No, 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 no. Make sure your your husband is there, and your husband uh, will take care of things. We got some silly-minded uh, Christian women who I'm going to take that man home and feed him and help him and so forth and give him some dollars and so girl sit down somewhere let your husband handle him why can't you take care of the women folk you take care of the help the lady well I just felt so much compassion for the man sit down you got something else going on Be wise as serpents, Jesus said, and harmless as doves. Because you're going to be the same one on the news. I tried to help this man, and and uh, he raped me, and I, did, I didn't think he would do that after I fed him and took him to Walmart and bought him some uh, Timberlands and some jeans and some pants and some shoes and so forth and everything. I, I thought he would be nice to me, but he ra ended up raping me. 
Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. In showing your love. Because some of the biggest con men and con women are on the street corner right now. They don't want a job. They're, they're conning you. So make sure you do things right. You discuss that with your husband. If your husband says no, you don't do it. If he says yes, then he'll be responsible. And he'll watch over you. And then most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, God is watching to see whether we will emulate his son in our behavior. In fact, we often allows any, he often allows enemies into our lives in order to test us and see how we will respond. You know it's true. Why is it that almost every Christian has an enemy? Some people have neighbors who are enemies. They don't even know the neighbors. But, but yet they are an enemy. Just because you, you, you tried to be friendly and you cut just a, a little portion of their grass to kind of make your grass stand out or whatever, they mad as far. They don't speak to you. They act like they hate the ground you walk on. That's fine. But you don't have to respond in kind. They pa they park their car too far on your property. You know it's on your property. They know it. And, and they're probably trying to provoke you. Don't, don't respond to that. Just go ahead and let them park there. Can you get into your garage? Uh, yes. Well, then just ride around the car and go on into your garage. And let it be. It has been going on for 90 days. Uh, let it go on for 120 days. Pray for them. Make sure they get a gospel track at least. If we respond to hate with hate, like so many of us do, we act as children of this world or worse, my beloved, we act like children of the devil. Always got to make my point. Always got to get my point across. Always got to put my two cents. Always got to give you a piece of my mind. Always got to respond. Always got to blow uh, like some little effeminate uh, devil. I'm talking to men now. Or some rebellious woman. Always got to say something. Always got to have the last word. Always got to uh, hit back with something. We call it in our day and time slap back. With so much writing going on today and original content online. Uh, somebody might say something about one person and then they, the, the, the article says so and so slap back by saying this right here. Slapping back is very popular today online. You say something negative about this person, they're going to slap back over here with hatred and venom. But if we respond with love, we show ourselves to be the children of God and citizens of heaven. Amen, somebody. And God does not ask us to do that which he himself has not done, does he? Verse 45 says that God maketh his son to rise on the evil, on those shacking up, those who are drunkards, those who are even homosexuals, his enemies, and on the good, those who are in church every Sunday morning. Those who are down at the shelter helping young women with their out of uh, wedlock pregnancy. Those who are down at the homeless shelter feeding people, sacrificing their time and feeding people. By the way, how many of you have ever been down to the mission, down to the city mission, the homeless mission? How many of you preachers have you... Uh, been down to the mission 
and gone down to help serve dinners and talk to the homeless people or preach to the homeless people. How many of you have been to the jails? No, you don't want to go there. You want to be seen. You want to be noticed. You don't want to help the homeless. You don't want to be around those people. I know of a preacher who said, well, if you go to jail, and if somebody goes to jail, now they won't see me. Because there, you know, there's a bunch of demons down there. And I want those demons jumping on me. And they might see somebody else go down there. I may send somebody else, but not me. I'm the pastor. If you don't love your own enemies, at least love God's enemies. Amen, somebody. And sendeth rain, the Bible says, on the just and on the unjust. I like what Annie J. Flint wrote. She said, His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Amen, somebody. And so, beloved, if God extends his hand of blessing even to those who deny his existence and speak ill of him, we have no right to withhold kind words and actions from those who treat us wrongly, who are even Judases to us. We too ought to give, give, and give again. The holiday we celebrate this weekend ought to be a great inspiration to us all, because God so loved the world that He gave, He gave, and He gave. And he gave again. Theologians refer to this truth as common grace. Something that God bestows on all people. God is good. Amen somebody. Regardless of their behavior. In Acts 14 Paul indicates to the people of Lystra that God's common grace is extended to all so that all may have reason to look to him and trust him. For salvation. I don't know about you, but God has been good to me. My mother even told me, and we don't even uh, get along that well. We don't even talk to each other that much. But she told me a while back, she said, Son, God has been good to you. Had a preacher to visit me uh, while I was preaching uh, from Macon, Georgia. He drove up on the hill where I was preaching at. And he told me, he said, Preacher, God has been good to you. God has been good to you. And I always wanted to reply, yes, I know. But I just let it be and let them say what they wanted to say. But God, I know. God has been good to me. And not only that, I know God has been good to you. I don't care what kind of situation you're in right now. I don't care what kind of tribulation you're in. Just remember that Jesus said, uh, Ye shall... Uh, experience tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world you're going to have tribulation in this life and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that tribulation is worse than trouble <laughs> but you're going to have trouble you're going to have tribulation you're going to have difficulty in this life but be of good cheer my beloved trust in Christ for he has overcome the world God will keep you in perfect peace and joy that word cheer means joy as a synonym for joy and he will give you joy and he will give you peace that pass of all understanding he said God left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness uh, and so for some of my uh, glutton friends as you know we've have, we have dealt with that over the past 100 days as well uh, God does bless us with food to enjoy it's okay enjoy yourself this weekend uh, but God does not want us to be gluttons don't overdo it 
and be ready to go on a 40-day fast with us, a Daniel fast, especially for gluttons in the church and those of us who are overweight, those of us who are uh, obese. Uh, please join us on that fast because nothing like fasting can break that stranglehold and that stronghold of gluttony. So when we do good to our enemies, it is a testimony to the work of our God in our lives through Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you that God is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself. If we love our enemies, as Jesus did, we can not only make them friends, but make them brothers and sisters in Christ, in the family of God. Amen, somebody. And speaking of that, in closing, my beloved, if you are with us today, and you are an enemy of Christ, and you therefore do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, dear friend, allow me to show you how you can place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation from hell. First, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws, and so have I. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, nobody's preaching down their nose at you. I'm just a uh, beggar telling other beggars where the bread is. The Bible says in Romans 3, uh, 23, For all have sinned. The black man has sinned. The white man has sinned. The yellow man has sinned. The red man has sinned. Presidents have sinned. Presidents have sinned. Senators have sinned, representatives have sinned, all important people have sinned, everyone in Hollywood has sinned, everyone in business has sinned, everybody has sinned against God from the Pope on down, from Billy Graham on down, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you have sinned too. Secondly, please understand and accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. Always. There's a penalty for crimes committed, as you well know. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die physically because of sin. And go, our bodies go to the grave our soul goes to hell. And that leads me to my third point. Dear friend, you need to accept the fact that you are on the road to hell right now. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, uh, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is an awful place. You do not want to go there. It is a place of torment. It is a place of pain. It is a place of a darkness you can feel. It is a place where you will never see God. You will never hear God's voice. Jesus is not there. Only the devil will be there. So, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, Jesus Christ was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He preached more on hell than any prophet in the Bible, anybody in the Bible. He preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Why did the Son of God, Jesus Christ, preach? Even in John 3.16, when he talked about perish, he's talking about hell. That's the reason why he was willing to suffer such a painful humiliation and shedding of blood and death for you and for me. He died not just to save you to have a good life and to live in a big fine house on Porkchop Hill and drive a Bentley. 
He didn't die for that. He died to save your soul from hell so that you can go to heaven with him to fellowship with him and his Father God. So hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. That includes you. If you're in this world, God loves you. He said, me, you. That he gave his only begotten son. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was speaking about himself. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That means have faith in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Would not perish. But have everlasting life. Perish where? Perish in hell. But have everlasting life where? In heaven. With God. So in order to be saved, dear friend, it is very simple. The devil will try to make it difficult. Even some preachers will try to make it difficult. You do not have to join a church to be saved. You do not have to be in a church to be saved. I got saved, saved outside of the church and I got saved in spite of the church. You don't have to get baptized to be saved. These things are good after you are saved. But the thief on the cross did not come down off the cross and get baptized when Jesus said to him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. All you have to do, dear friend, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, shed his blood on the cross for your sins, as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world was buried he died, was buried, and rose from the dead by the power of God for you so that you can live forever with Him in heaven. Pray and ask Him to come into your heart to save your soul today, and He will save you. Romans 10, 9 and 13 says that if thou, you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou and you shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is how I got saved, December the 19th, 1979, just a few days ago. And this is how you can be saved today. If you're believing in your heart right now on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Pray with me right now what is called commonly the sinner's prayer. Just repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. because I have broken your commandments. I have lied before and I have uh, been dishonest. I have lusted after people and things. I have dishonored and disrespected my parents. And I have stolen things before. I realize that I am guilty of these crimes and more. And that just like a criminal deserves jail, I deserve hell. Please have mercy and grace upon me for Jesus Christ's sake and please forgive me of all of my sins as I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for my sins, was buried and rose again. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. To turn from my old life and to follow you in the new life. 
In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Just now He will save you. He will save you. He will save you. Just now. Just now. Jesus will save you. Jesus will save you. Just now. Now, dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again, allow me to say to you, congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and praying to Him and asking Him to save you. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com, and let us know, or you can email one of our many other emails, or Twitter account, Facebook, I don't know how Elizabeth and... Evangeline and others get the information, but they will send you some free material that we want you to have to help you grow in the faith. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well, and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Dear friend, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good is our prayer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our uh, service for today, the 100th day in a row, uh, where this poor preacher had the privilege of preaching the gospel every day. Now, tomorrow is Christmas, and I always preach on Christmas. I do believe the church doors ought to be open and the church bells ought to be ringing on Christmas. And if uh, for some reason your church is not going to be open, I'll be here preaching tomorrow by the grace of God. Uh, tomorrow morning uh, at around 11 o'clock Central Time, 12 o'clock Eastern. And I'll be preaching a little message titled, Christmas According to Linus and Courage According to Charles. I pray that you will join us and uh, be with us on tomorrow. And then, of course, uh, I'll... Uh, I'll be here first thing in the morning by the grace of God if the Lord should tarry his coming and we live for the White House family devotions uh, that will continue to roll on and then uh, after the preaching tomorrow I'll take a break for a while before I resume another leg of 100 days of preaching the gospel thank you so much for your prayers thank you so much for your support it's been a very tough and difficult leg this time for some reason and so your support, your encouragement, your amens, you dear folks on Periscope, you, ju you just outdid yourselves, and on Facebook Live and uh, all of the other outlets, we give God the glory, the praise and honor for you, and thank you for your prayers and support. Mm -hmm.